Hey everybody, it's Dr. D. It's good to see you again. Uh, today I want to talk about, uh, we're going to begin talking about statistical inference. Um, and we're going to begin talking about confidence intervals. Um, and in order to do this, there are a few basic concepts you, you need to already have understood. Um, we need to understand the concept of a random variable. Um, and a random variable is uh, the outcome, a number, numerical outcome from some process. Um, that we can't know until the uh, until the process is complete, right? So we have to observe a, a realization of this random process, uh, and that'll give us a random variable. Um, these random variables generally will have a distribution, uh, and the one we pay the most attention to, the distribution that we've we've focused on the most, is called the normal distribution. Uh, the normal distribution uh, has some nice properties. Um, it is symmetrical. It has a total area of one. Uh, it can take uh, the values can take any real number, and when we started talking about normal distributions, um, we were talking about variable uh, x, using x as our random variable. Um, and then we had, a, you know, uh, the two parameters for a normal distribution are its mean, uh, which we indicate as mu subscript x, meaning the mean of the distribution of x. And then it has a standard deviation, uh, subscript x, that's a sigma. So we've got a mu, got a sigma, and they stand for population parameters, mean, and standard deviation. That's why mu, 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 mu mean, sigma, standard deviation. Um, okay, so we talked about random variables. We talked about normal distribution. Uh, the other thing, the key insight that we just finished up was um, that uh, the normal distribution doesn't really govern that much about uh, individuals and individual characteristics. There are some individual characteristics that are normally distributed, but it works really well when instead of looking at x and, um, and and realizations of x, we look at x bar, where x bar is a sample mean. And instead of thinking of this as a drawing of all of the individuals in the population, <coughs> right, um, we can now think of this as uh, what we call a sampling distribution, where it's not a drawing of individuals, it's a drawing that contains the visual depiction of all of the samples. Um, so this is the sampling distribution of x bar, which is to say when we pick a sample, that sample is going to have a mean of whatever value we care about. Let's say it's a, um, the number of miles you might drive on a, on a rental car. Right? You work for a rental car agency. We want to know how many miles you drive. Each individual person uh, has a value of x, or each renter has a value of x. Uh, and I don't know what the distribution of that looks like. That, that distribution is going to be shaped in a way that it's hard for me to know or predict. Um, but what I can say is if we collect, say, 30 drivers or 50 drivers or 100 drivers and average out um, the, the number of miles they all drive and find the average for that group of 100, this drawing um, is a model that can help us figure out what's likely to happen. If you select a group of 100 drivers, um, you're selecting in that process a number, which would be the average miles driven, right? That, that would be what X bar stands for within the sample, right? And what you're doing when you're drawing a sample is you're also picking a number, that x bar, right? And that number that you're picking from has, a, has randomness that is uh, well understood. It comes from a normal distribution. So you might get a sample right here, right, from this region of the distribution. Uh, and then you would get an x bar here. Or let's say, you know, you had people who drove a little bit more on in your sample, different sample, right? You might get an x bar here. Um, and these are all just different realizations of this random variable, right? The random process is picking 100 drivers and then calculating the mean. Now, it's possible but less likely that you'd get one that's all the way up here, but it's still clearly possible. Let's call it x bar 3, or one down here, x bar 4. <coughs> and we know how likely it is because we know that it's a normal distribution. And we also know mu, and we also know sigma. What we're going to do today is we're going to attack the next of our three terrible assumptions. So for those of you who've been following along, um, you'll know that I uh, talked about our three terrible assumptions. We have to make them to be able to play around with normal distributions. Um, but in the end, to get to statistical inference where we can make uh, new um, human knowledge with statistics, we have to get rid of these. The first one was that x is normally distributed. And last time we met, we got rid of that. We said we don't need x to be normally distributed we can look at x bar and p bar because of the central limit theorem, which tells us that x bar and p bar, if uh, n is sufficiently large, they are normally distributed in nature. Right? When, when you c collect them, they're naturally normally distributed. The second terrible assumption is that we know 
mu x. And the third terrible assumption is we know sigma x. We're going to get rid of uh, the second one today uh, to get started. And to, right now, I'm mostly going to talk about um, uh, the intuition here. We'll get into some numerical examples probably in the next video. But I, I, I just want to point out that we can look at two different uh, approaches to this, and we will. We're going to follow one path for a while, um, and then it kind of hits a natural end, and then we'll back up and we'll follow another path. Uh, so the, um, we know if we don't know mu x, <coughs> um, one approach would be to say, can we get close? Can we, can we estimate it? And sometimes close enough is close enough, right? So if we know that it's a, that we don't know exactly what mu x is, but we know it's within a particular range, well, as long as that range is where we need it to be, that could be sufficient. Um, and then the other approach we'll take, and this will be for a different day, is um, we, if we don't know mu x, what can we say? Um, and this is like um, hypothesis testing. Can we say something, can we say something is true or false? And that's more about kind of testing a, a belief or a, a, a proposition about the world. But today we're going to look at estimation. To do that, what we need to do is we need to um, throw out the idea that we have mu x and then try to say um, what would happen. So um, for a second, we're going to continue to uh, believe we know mu x um, just to draw the picture, just like we did above, right? Which is to say we've got a large number line, lots of possible samples to choose from. Um, but because of the central limit theorem, we know that probability looks something like this and that shouldn't touch I don't think it quite does and if we know then we've got mu x here and we've got sigma x here and this is the normal distribution and those tails go all the way off into infinity right um, and uh, this is actually sorry mu x bar sigma x bar I want to be careful there because this is the central limit theorem's result right if we know what mu is um, then we can then we know what mu x bar is because that's the same and then if we know the truth about the population values of, uh, of uh, standard deviation, then we can find sigma x bar. That allows us to draw this curve. And then if we pick a sample, let's say that we pick a sample right here. It doesn't really matter. It just has to be I don't know, somewhere in the meaty part of it for now. So let's say we, we do draw a sample, and then we calculate the mean, and this is the value we get. What we know now is that this is a pretty reasonable value, right? It's not far in the tails. It's not the same as mu. If we wanted to use x bar to estimate mu, it's not going to be equal to mu x bar, but um, right, it's not equal, but it's pretty close. Uh, the world we live in, though, is a world where we don't actually know what the value of mu x or sigma x is. So instead, what this process looks like is we've got this big long number line full of uh, possible values to choose for our sample mean um, and then we selected a sample and then this is what we know we measured all those drivers and this is how far the average was and that's it that is the sum total of our knowledge right um, actually for now what we're going to do is we're going to continue to assume we know sigma x um, we're not going to get rid of that one just yet just because it makes the math a little simpler um, so we know what shape by assumption, let's say, we know what shape the curve is going to take. What we don't know, because this, this captures kind of the spread outness or the shape, <clears throat> what we don't know is what this captures, which is the location, right? Mu captures the location of the curve. Because if you think about it, um, this curve has this shape because of the spread outness, but we could slide it to the left or to the right. And so if we had to guess what the true curve is, the true sampling distribution, right? So if we're trying to work backwards. Normally, we draw the sampling distribution and then we find our x-bar. But if all we have is the x-bar, if we had to pick the um, the sampling distribution that's most likely to generate this x-bar, it would clearly be the one where it's at the peak, right? Where it goes like this, and then it's supposed to be shaped exactly like the one above, but I'm not that good at drawing. That's fine. It would look something like, wow, that's hideous. Let me try that again. So it should look there. That's much better should look something like that right where the peak is right there now we know and so you know we know that's probably not right this would be the case if x bar actually equaled mu x bar or mu x right that would be at the peak the x bar would be at the peak um and we know that's not likely to be the case right um so what can we do well the way that we try to address what do we think mu could be is we're going to look at uh sort of the two worst case scenarios Let's imagine 
that instead of getting the most likely curve, we actually got a very unlikely curve. What we want is we want the least likely but not implausibly so scenarios, right? So not the least likely, because the least likely would be like, oh, we, you know, we happen to get the, I don't know, we ask 100 drivers, we got the 100 drivers who drew, drew, drove the most um, within our entire population. We don't want that. We just want, like, some pretty unlikely stuff. Um, and so what does that look like? Well, we've got two scenarios. One is um, we've got some light drivers, meaning they don't drive very much, right? Um... And the other is we've got people who are involved in uh, high mileage drivers, right? Whatever, that's, that's what I mean. Low mileage versus high mileage drivers. And I don't mean that, um, that that's what our population is. I mean, we happened to get a sample, because this can happen, you're taking random samples. In this first scenario, we happened to get a sample where um, the drivers just, just so happened, by chance, to be lighter uh, than average. They drove less than you, you would expect. Maybe they, um, they rented a car because they had a voucher or because uh, it was a discount, and they wanted the freedom to be able to drive places, but actually they ended up having a pretty good time at the conference or at the hotel. They didn't end up driving very far, um, or maybe the, the restaurant bar turned out to be really good, so uh, nobody felt the need to go out to eat or anything, um, <coughs> or at least for a, a subset of those drivers, a, a disproportionate subset. This other group right here, for whatever reason, maybe they um, they're really interested in um, highway design, and so they move, they they fly to a city, they rent a car, and they just do circles around the uh, around the perimeter, and then, uh, and then and then turn the car back in with the odometer much higher than it was before. So considering these two scenarios, if our sample has a bunch of light drivers in it, then it means that in the correct curve, it would be in the lower tail, right? Now, if it was all the way over here. Right? That sample is just really unlikely. So we're not going to assume that we ended up all the way in the tail. What we're going to do is we're going to draw another curve here such that it positions this group at the bottom left, but not all the way in the tail of the curve. Which is to say, um, weirdly, another way of saying this, this least likely, is this. Th we're going to draw one where x bar is weirdly low. But again, not like preposterously low, just just weirdly low. If that's the case, then what you have is the peak of the curve is over here, right? Um, because now x bar is in the left tail, and relative to the true mean, this would be the true mean if x bar is weirdly low. Um, that's where the curve would be if we happen to get drivers that didn't drive very much oversampled within our sample by random chance. And that's just sampling error. We didn't do anything wrong. It's just you pick 100 random people, you're going to get all types, right? On the other hand, we have this other worst case scenario where x bar is weirdly high, where we happen to get heavy drivers, high mileage drivers. If that's the case, then, um, then this x bar would be in the right tail. So what we need to do now is we need to draw a curve. I'm going to try to draw right to left and just get it to work out right. We need to draw another curve where x bar is, uh, it's a little too far in the tail. Let's try that again. Where x bar is in the right tail, but again, not too far in the tail. That's pretty good. And that yields a mu over here. This would be, right, this is the peak of this curve. This would be mu if x bar is weirdly high. Now, could mu be somewhere else? Could mu be over here? If mu is over here, then the true curve would look like this. Could that happen? It absolutely could happen. But if that does happen, if that did happen, right, what that would imply was despite this being the sampling distribution, right, and this being all the probability, we happen to get an x bar that was so high that what would the likelihood be of choosing an x bar like this? Well, we've looked at this with sampling, and you can see that, you know, this this higher higher is the area in this tail, which is actually quite low. It might be one in a trillion, you know, one divided by a trillion <coughs> or something like that, one in a billion. What we're going to assume is that when we define how weird... How strange are we willing to, uh, to accept? The answer to that, we'll call it the confidence level. And we're going to generally assume that the answer to that confidence level, we'll use a Greek letter alpha to indicate it. Um, our x bars, 
the things we actually observe, um, we're going to treat them as possibly weird. That's what we did with those first two curves. But again, not implausible, but not preposterous, right? We are not under the impression that we are witnessing um, miraculous events every time we collect a sample. And that's what this would require, right? If we are to believe that the true mu is actually over here, then what we have witnessed, if we witness this X bar, which we actually did witness, right? That would require us to believe that that was a truly once in a lifetime, maybe once in a, uh, once in a, a thousand years or once in a hundred thousand years event, right? And we, we're just not in the habit of believing that on a regular basis. Instead, what we've done is we've set these two other curves, this one here and this one here, so they're right at the outer bounds. Those are essentially the worst case scenarios that we are willing to credit, given the um, the operating principle that we are not witnessing miraculous events. We are just collecting a sample, and uh, and it might be strange, but it's not going to be like absurd. It's not going to be preposterous. If that's the case, right? If we are willing to believe that the X bar we got is pretty pretty typical, it's within say the middle 95% of all samples, uh, the middle 99% of all samples, um, and not like the one in one billionth sample. Um, then what we can say is this might not be mu, right? X bar might not get it exactly right. But mu is probably somewhere, like right here, this could be mu, it's probably not. Because if this is the case, x bar is weirdly high, but it's it's possible. We're willing to allow for the possibility that mu is all the way over here. Similarly, this is an unlikely value of mu, more unlikely than this, but it's, um, because we would have to have witnessed a very low set of x bars, but it's just on the outside edge of our credulity. And then somewhere in between here, you know, this range, this region contains all of the values of mu from the lowest plausible value to the highest plausible value. This range or this, this interval between this mu, call this mu1, and this mu, call this mu2, this range is the set of, um, set of values that we are confident mu could, um, mu could take. Um, and the, the way we describe this, right, this interval that we're confident about, we call this a confidence interval. Um, and so that's just a little bit messy. I've written a lot, so I'm going to redraw this part of the drawing real quick for you, just so you can kind of wrap your head around what's happening. What we're doing is we're saying, okay, so we've got all the possible values of x bar we could get, and then what happens is we actually witness one. Uh, it doesn't, where, right here. We actually witness a value of x bar. Okay, so what values could mu take? Well, it certainly could take the value of x bar because it's possible, you know, we, we know that happened for a group, but it would be pretty unlikely. What we're going to do is we're going to assume, let's assume that x bar is pretty high and actually the true value of mu is to the left over here. That means that this middle region, x bar is at the top of the middle alpha. That would give us mu 1. Or we could assume that x bar is actually pretty low and the true value is to the right, in which case... We put x bar at the bottom end of the middle alpha, where alpha is a number, right? So this pro this area is going to be, alpha usually takes on numbers like 0.9 or 0.95 or 0.99, something like that. Um, and that implies that the true value of mu is over here. Again, we're assuming we know sigma x bar um, so that we can draw these well. Um, and that's what a confidence interval is, right? A confidence interval is generally a value of mu or a region in which a value of mu could be provided an interval notation where we report it as mu1 comma mu2 and that's just our way of reporting this region and so that's the intuition of a confidence interval um, we pick a level of alpha which says how confident uh, do we want to be essentially um, the higher that number the more careful we're being to include more plausible values of x bar uh, and then that tells us, well, if we are going to commit to the belief that X bar falls within, say, the middle 99% of all possible samples, um, that implies the true value of mu must have some uh, range that it could be in, right? Um, so that X bar is always in the middle 99% of all samples. And then based on that, we can work our way through um, the four steps that we learned for normal distributions to get to um, a confidence interval. But that's the intuition, right? We, we can say, if we need to get rid of the assumption that we know what mu is, what we can do is say, well, we're going to replace that with a belief that X bar is typical, right? You know, somewhat typical, meaning um, not not stranger. We didn't witness a one out of a hundred event, but, you know, just a 
somewhere between the, 90, the other 99 out of 100 events, then we can then say, we, we don't know mu, but we can say with confidence that it is within this range. For many purposes, that is sufficient. All right, that's the intuition of confidence intervals. Um, next time we meet, we'll do a numerical example to kind of show you how this works. Thanks a lot. See you guys.